नमो तस् भगवतो अरहतो सम्मा संबुद्धस् The subject of the discourse today is uh, what motivates action. In this series on karma and rebirth, that is action and its fruit in the form of a recurring existence, to be born again and again and die and again reborn and so on. This business of samsaric existence. Now, in this series, we have been discussing from different uh, point of, points of view. Today, I will. Uh, uh, it, it will be based on what is called nidana sutta. Nidana really means that which originates things, that which uh, pr- uh, brings about. That which causes, and so on, nidana. So the Lord Buddha gave this sutta, this teaching, when he was staying in Savatthi, and it is found in Anguttara Nikaya, in the Tiganipata, the third part of Anguttara Nikaya. We have translated this, and I will read it out first of all, and then explain the the. Underlying significance of the sutta, it is a profound sutta, and also it really brings out a very hopeful message that we can get out of this vicious circle of worldly existence by using the same force, the force that keep uh, keeps a being tied to this. Worldly existence and all the sufferings undergo the sufferings of worldly sufferings, uh, worldly existence. Now the same force can be used in order to get out of this vicious circle. Just as it is said that with one poison you nullify another poison. Even so, with one set of action you uh, do away with. Uh, you see another set of action that uh, brings us into bondage. So the sutta proper, the translation reads as follows. This is, he um, addresses the monks there. He says, monks, there are these three motives inducing volitional actions. Volitional action means karma. Which three? Greed motivates volitional action, hatred motivates volitional action, and delusion motivates volitional action. Whatever action is performed out of greed, is born of greed, is motivated by greed, is caused by greed, that action ripens wherever one is reborn. There will be the space wherever one is reborn, and whenever that action ripens, then does one experience the consequence thereof of that action, whether it be in this very life or in the next life or in any other life thereafter, or that action, the consequences can be. Uh, you see, nullified. It can be made dysfunctional. So, and that is how one can outgrow it. Similarly, whatever action is performed out of hatred, the same thing. You see, out of hatred, and it, uh, when that action ripens, wherever one is reborn, and. Whenever that action ripens, then uh, one da- one experiences the consequences thereof, whether this life, next life, and the other life, or you dis- make it defunct, dysfunctional, defunct. Similarly, whatever action is performed, motivated by delusion and caused by delusion and so on, that action. 
ripens wherever one is reborn. And whenever the action ripens, then only does one experience the consequences of that action, whether it be in this life, next life, or any life thereafter, or it is nullified. Now, these three are, these are the three motives, as we have read at, at the very beginning, that uh, greed motivates, hatred motivates, delusion motivates action, uh, volitional action, that is uh, karma. And when whatever these actions, you see, uh, they, whatever action is performed by any one of these three, uh, the, the roots of karma, they are called the roots, mula, or also hetu of karma, then they are bound to produce result somewhere, either in this life, next, or thereafter, or wherever we are reborn. I mean, they don't, they continue as a potential force until they are, uh, until they ripen, they continue within the stream of consciousness in our mind. The mind is the carrier of the karmic force and they continue. And so, uh, whenever the right time comes, it is not, the here two things will have to be understood. One is that they continue from life to life until they fructify, they ripen. And wherever we are born, then it's, it may be it may uh, ripen anywhere in any life only at the right time. Now this timing is very very important because when the right time uh, arrives, only then it can ripen and produce the fruit thereof. Now you can see how they were in the case of uh, the two cases I have already discussed in, during this series. That is of Chunda the uh, pig butcher, how his consequences in this very life, he, you see, uh, the evil deed that he perpetrated for 55 years, how he experienced in this very life the, uh, the sufferings of hell. Before he actually went into the hells, he suffered here, all those hellish states. Similarly, the other one, the Dhammika Upasaka, in this very life experienced what uh, he was bound to experience in the, in the next life. That is to say, Tusita. He was born in Tusita and enjoyed all the great, divine, blissful life. But before he actually was reborn, here and now he experienced part of it. So here, the timing, the karmic force, once you do the karma, motivated by either greed or hatred or delusion, they are the motivating force, they are like the fuel of the vehicle. You may have a very posh car, my goodness, spending a million dollars, but then if you don't have the fuel, that car is absolutely useless. It remains stationary, you can't do anything. But the fuel by itself also won't work or will not drive the car. It will not run the car unless there is the engine which produces power out of that fuel and then runs the vehicle. The vehicle will run, you see, only when there are first of all the fuel and then there is the power the engine which turns the fuel into, you see, uh, into the um, uh, force, into uh, the power which runs the vehicle. So here we have two things then. One, you have got this Lova Dosa Moha as the fueling agency, so to say. They are the roots of karma and they induce karma. Now, karma the Lord Buddha defined and we have discussed in this series, karma is threefold, 
that is karma as a mental action, as a, a verbal action, and as a uh, bodily action. So it starts, the karma as a bija of karma starts, you see, uh, it starts as, uh, you see, intention or volition. That means you will to act. The will to act, that is the beginning of karma. That is karma proper. That is the content of karma. So it is like the engine that, uh, you see, uh, translates the fuel into power and runs the vehicle. So here, the three roots of karma which motivates and the intention which turns the motivations into an actual engine here, uh, you see a source of power which gives the, which causes the destiny. Where is, how this karma is to, where it, where it should ripen and how it should ripen at what time and what kind of consequence it produces. So this, uh, so, so far we have, uh, you see, the karmas, it is about the lova dosa moha driven karma. And the example given in the sutta is this. He said, monks, suppose seeds that are not broken, not rotten, not damaged, by wind or heat, capable of sprouting and well embedded when sown in a good field, the soil whereof is properly prepared. Also there were to be steady rain and in right measure. Now those seeds which have all these uh, factors, you see, which are capable of sprouting, etc., which is uh, properly embedded in a good soil, so on, and then it gets all the rain and in proper measure. Now these seeds would come to growth because they have all the conditions for uh, the seeds to come to growth and then thrive and then multiply and become plentiful. Now the example of a crop, let us say. You have the um, uh, paddy. It's just a seed. Now out of that paddy, you sow the paddy, you, uh, you sow it on the soil, which is properly prepared, and and then make sure that the the seed is properly embedded and is capable of sprouting. Now once all these factors are there you can expect that the, it, will, it will sprout, then it will grow into a little uh, seedling, and the seedling can be again uh, broadcasted, it can be put, to, you see, you can grow a whole lot of seedlings, and then fill up an entire, um, you see, acre of land or a hectare of land with that. So then this plant grows in different stages, and then it produces the, again the same paddy, paddy crop. Now, an important question here to be understood and I would like every one of you to deeply, uh, you see, to uh, pay attention and try to understand. It's a very deep thing. It's a question of the soul and atma and all that sort of thing. That uh, is, uh, you know, that uh, creates so much of a misconception about life and karma. Now, these seeds, the first seed which is embedded, when it grows into a plant, and then it produces, let us say, thousands of paddy. Now the question is whether the first seed that uh, sprouted into the form of a plant and then produced all these uh, thousand seed, uh, paddy seeds. Are the same or are they different? Can you say that the first seed is the same as these thousand seeds? The thousand seeds that have come up 
through the instrumentality of this first seed? No. You can't say that they are same. No. Nor can you say that they are different in the sense that if the first seed were not there, these thousand seeds would not have come. So there is a connection. There is a relationship. There is this heredity. You see, they have the same gene having the same kind of, uh, you see, the particular characteristic of a gene that the paddy seed will produce only paddy, not wheat or any other thing like that. So this, what happens is the passing over of characteristics. The, th the first seed produced this thousand seeds. The characteristic of the first one has been, uh, you see, passed over to the others, the heredity factor. So from life to life a person, a person has committed a karma and then it's, it can ripen wherever the person is, is bound to ripen and the ripen in the form of a life. Next, Punarjanma, that is a rebirth. Wherever one is born, this karmic force will uh, produce a result, but at the proper time, when the time, right time comes. Now suppose, now this will happen when all the factors are ready with the, um, uh, with the karma. First of all, there is the time factor, then when it is going to be, um, uh, you say, the uh, space factor, where it is going to be reborn, under what condition, and so on. There are so many factors there. And when all these factors are present, then uh, one is reborn, and there the fruit, uh, you see, it ripens, and then um, one gets the fruit of it. Now, the, in the case of uh, uh, Chunda, you see, he suffered here and now. And in the case of uh, the Upasaka, Dhammika Upasaka, he enjoyed here and now. What is to happen in future that he experienced. Because the, the seed was very, very powerful seed, obviously. Uh, so this example of a seed, uh, now, it is said that how can you be reborn unless you have got some permanent stuff called soul or self or whatever you give, some name that you give, Atma and Paramatma and all that. So unless that is there, who is reborn? That is the question put. It's not a question of who is reborn, but reborn the karmic force you see, is passed on from one life to the other just as from the, the, the first paddy, the gene characteristics are passed on to a thousand paddy seeds in the same manner. So they are neither different nor the same. They have, is passing over of a karmic force, of a uh, heredity factor. So the Anatta, taught by Lord Buddha, in connection with the karma and punarjama, uh, you see, will have to be understood in this way. How without a permanent entity called Atma or soul or self and all that, how life process continues, you see, life after life after our life, because it's a force, it's a karmic force. At the right time, it produces the result. And if you can intervene, now let us say here, another, uh, further it is said that uh, there are these three motives inducing volitional action, which three non-greed, in the first it is said greed, here it is said non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion, uh, you see, motivate a act volitional action. And then whatever action is performed out of non-greed, and uh, it is motivated by non-greed and so on, when 
by such action. You see, when you produce, when you uh, uh, perform an action motivated by non-greed, automatically what happens is the greed factor, which is also inside, gets eliminated. When you practice, let's say, dana, which is non-motivated by non-greed, at that time, at the same time, you can't have greed and uh, uh, grab that what you are giving. See, if you are giving something, you can't grab it back and take it away. So greed and non-greed motivating factors cannot coexist. When you have non-greed, at that time greed is eliminated automatically. It cannot be there. It's absent. The presence of non-greed makes the absence of greed automatic. And now when it is, uh, you see, when that greed, no, greed is eliminated by the performance of an action which is motivated by non-greed, then the, the chetana, the intention or karma and, and its seed form, the karma also is given up. If you have the greed, is bound to produce a karma anyway. So when you have done away with the greed by practicing non-greed, what will happen is the karma which would have come out of the greed also gets eliminated, is given up, is abandoned. So when greed cannot function anymore in this way because non-greed is functioning. Another example, for instance, now a certain party is ruling over the state. Party number, a party A is ruling. Now before that party B was ruling. And before that party C was ruling. Now this party A having um, captured power eliminates party B, party C. Both these parties B and C are dysfunctional, they can't operate. They have no power over the governmental machinery. They are like any other citizen like you and me, who are powerless ever. And we want to be powerless anyhow. So, now here you are. So when you have a good karma motivated by generosity, non-greed means generosity, Non-hatred means uh, loving-kindness or compassion, uh, metta, etc. And uh, non-delusion means wisdom. Now when you are motivated by any of these three wholesome uh, karmic, um, you see, roots, these three wholesome karma mulas, then the unwholesome one gets eliminated automatically because both cannot coexist. Bad and good, these two cannot coexist. Either they will be good or they will be bad. So, the bad one, when it gets eliminated, the greed gets eliminated, the greed induces karma, that is intention. So that intention, karma also gets eliminated at the mental level. And when it gets eliminated at the mental level, where the bodily and verbal, uh, you see, translation cannot take place. So you can, by making up your mind to stick to your sila, pancha sila, let us say, for the upasaka, upasakas, by sticking to your sila, you automatically eliminate the possibility of greed, hatred and delusion and the karmas induced by these, you eliminate them, abandon them. Now when you have eliminated, let us say the uh, party number B is eliminated, what will happen? The party number A is ruling, so it will, it will bribe now, that is the unfortunate reality, what is happening and it should never happen in a good democracy. Now, for instance, in the olden democracies of uh, 
uh, let's say in Britain in, or other European countries or America, they don't have this phenomena at all. Buying over MLAs and then you hijack them and take them to Hyderabad or somewhere and uh, keep them in a jail, so to say, in a big uh, uh, mansion and so that they cannot come and, uh, uh, you see, uh, undo their uh, machinations here. No, this is happening in this democracy anyway. And all the evil results of that, all the painful results, thousands of people who have no home, they can't, they are helpless now, they can't get anything. So you can see, when B, you say A is L, A it in power, B is eliminated, then it is made not only dysfunctional, atrophied, so to say. That means they become paralyzed. You have got a hand, but the hand is paralyzed. It can't function. It can't work. It's gone. It's as good as dead. So these other parties fear that they become, their MLAs are being purchased. So they become paralyzed. And this is how democracy is completely outwitted and you can see what happened, the consequences. So if you use uh, the same analogy, it's only an example, not that it's, it works exactly that way. Now if you are doing good deed, kusala karma, you automatically eliminate akusala karma. Uh, I mean the uh, roots of akusala karma, lower dosa moha. And thereby the karma itself also is eliminated. Now, the, the implication, you have, let us say, we have done hundreds of thousands of karmas in the past life, or in this very life. Now, the bad karmas we have done, if they don't get a chance to uh, sprout, so to say, they are now within, in the, in the uh, uh, stream of consciousness, they are just flowing along with the mind, with the consciousness, with this river of mind. Now if they don't get a chance to sprout, so to say, to come up and get activated, then they get atrophied by sheer getting weakened and weakened. This party number B is getting weakened, weakened and so on. So there is no chance of getting into power again. Now that is the theory anyway, but whether it works or not is a different story. But in the case of karma, we are using as an analogy, that's all. But you can debilitate the effect of past bad karmas. You can weaken them so that they cannot sprout out. They cannot come out and produce a result. Now, let us say, in this life, you have done certain bad karmas in the past, and they can, uh, you see, express themselves in this life. They can come out and produce a result. Suppose, as a layman, a Panchashila you are following, you keep on practicing your Panchashila very, very sincerely, and you meditate on top of that and keep the mind clean. There is no chance for all those bad karmas to come and sprout and give result. So by doing these good karmas all the time, when, when your time comes to uh, pass away, you are reborn in the Deva Loka or as an, uh, in the human Loka at a higher level. There are uh, human beings who live the life of a, um, uh, you see, evil spirit or an animal. And there are human beings who live the life of a God, of a divine being. So you are now, if you have, through your good karmas, acquired so much of punya that you are born in a very high state as a human being or in the divine plane. So you have outwitted all those, uh, you see, karmas which you would have, uh, you see, um, acted in this particular life. So they become what is called ahosi kamma, or dysfunctional and then paralyzed, defunct. 
So by and karma, you buy a set of karma, you can overcome another set of karma. Now this message is the most hopeful message indeed of the teachings of the Buddha. So in this sutta, the example given of the good karma is again the bija. I will read it out. Suppose seeds that are not broken, <coughs> not rotten, not damaged, <coughs> sorry, capable of sprouting and well embedded. And a man were to burn these seeds, they are well embedded on the field, they are all there. He takes some hay or some dry, uh, dry grass and on, they spread on the, uh, on the soil and put the whole thing on fire. All the seeds get burnt. Now uh, uh, he burns these seeds with fire. After burning, reduce them into ash. And after reducing them into ash, he were to winnow and winnow the ash in a strong wind. <clears throat> or cast it to be carried away by a swift stream. When those seeds are thus rendered, you know, useless, uh, will not be able, now they are, this, those seeds are having been rendered useless in this way, they are cut off at the very root as a seed. And they are made like a palm tree stump which cannot grow into a tree again and rendered incapable of coming up again and not to be subject to arising anymore in future. So those karmas which you have fructified in, in this life and you have made them dysfunctional, they cannot arise anymore because you have burnt them up by your good karma. That simple as that. That is why Lord Buddha said, Sila is the very foundation of spiritual life. Which simply means make an end of this repeated recurring existence of samsaric existence. By doing this good karma, you give, you give no chance to the, uh, you see, to the bad karmas you have done in the past to come up in this life, and thereby they can't fructify again in future. You have, so to say, you have burnt them up, made them dysfunctional or defunct. Now this hopeful message that by karma you can do away with all karmas, it must be kept in mind. And in this process, this, uh, you know, speculation about a soul or about a, um, uh, you see, uh, from life to life, a soul traveling and all that. Absolutely unnecessary theory. They have no relationship whatsoever. It's a karmic force. <coughs> it's not a permanent thing. It's not the same seed that becomes a thousand seed. No. The characteristics of the first seed, as a, as a hereditary law, is passed over because it has to get exhausted. Once you do a karma, it must get exhausted in the form of producing a result. So there is nothing permanent in that karma anyhow. So this message should be kept in mind and you must understand therefore the importance of practicing sila and samadhi and panya. The Noble Eightfold Path is not a theory. It's a matter of life. You live this in this very life. So follow the Sheila, practice the Pancha Sheila, however difficult they may be. But no compromise and follow them. Practice meditation and clean up the mind, purify the mind. Sheila purifies our actions karmas. And samadhi purifies the mind from where the karmas arise. 
and panyar wisdom purifies intelligence factor and brings about the intuitive insight into reality and it makes an end of all karmic forces and thereby all defilements of mind and thereby freedom from rebirth because rebirth occurs due to karma which is motivated by defilement now this is the message of the sutta we will continue in this series to discuss about action because ultimately it is our action that liberates us that creates what we are our destiny what we are going to be in future will come from our action so be mindful of action and then you can decide or what kind of destiny you want to have with this we conclude may the blessings of lord buddha his teaching dhamma and sangha surround your life with wisdom may you all be happy and well